Okay, I have pressed record. Test, test, test. Yeah, that's good. I am pressing record. All right. And it's recording. Promise? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then here we go. Astronomycast, episode 251 for Monday, February 6, 2012. Messier Objects. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evansville. Hi, Pamela. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing really well. I think the weather's starting to improve. Things are getting uh, nice and sunny. It's good. That day, you know, spring in January is just plain wrong. Yep. Um, spring in February is still mostly wrong, but uh, yeah, I have to admit my bulbs are starting to come up, so this is a very odd year. That's good. All right, so, so, uh, so have you ever looked into the sky and noticed a fuzzy blob? That's a Messier object, carefully cataloged by Charles Messier to make it easier to find comets. We'll learn about the history of the catalog, Messier's criteria, and some of the prominent objects that you might see. All right, Pamela. So I, I've done this. I've rediscovered many of the Messier objects <laughs> on my own. I used to, I used to do that. I, I would go outside, look up, you know, really dark skies. And where I grew up, we had just beautiful dark skies, great big Milky Way, and especially in winter, the sky just yeah. pops. You know, you get out there at like midnight, one in the morning, and it's just amazing. And then what I would do is I would look around and look for stuff just off sort of I couldn't quite see that there was something yeah. there and you, you would see it out of the corner of your eye and then you'd look over and maybe you wouldn't see something and then you'd look away again and you'd see this fuzzy bit. And then or, I or would... Yeah, and sometimes it's not even required to use off-axis uh, off viewing. Um, I, yeah, it's, I, I keep rediscovering the fuzzy blob in the center of cancer. That's my special ability. Wh which one is that? I... I See, this is the problem with that constantly rediscover yeah. it. I believe yeah. that one's the beehive. Right, right, right. Right, and so what you do is you, you look at these, you know, you, you would look at these blurry things, and then I would pull out my star chart. And I had a nice, beautiful, uh, I have Night Watch, by the way, if you want. My w number one recommendation for a, uh, a, like a book that lists all of the objects in the night sky and how to find them, I love Night Watch. Um, so I had that book, and I would look at it and find the object, and, and I would be discovering, oh, that's, you know, the great uh, galaxy Andromeda. Oh, that's the, um, uh, the great nebula in Orion. And so, yeah. as you said, for a lot of these things, you're rediscovering them. And these are the Messier objects. And, and if you ever have, have seen a comet with your own eyes, you know, that's something completely different. And you need to keep them straight. So, so let's look about Charles Messier. He went, so went, who was Charles Messier? Um, Charles Messier was a French astronomer who uh, worked in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And he's, like many of us, someone who as a kid just had this moment of, oh my god, astronomy is so awesome, that's what I want to spend my life doing. And for him that moment of complete awesome was the great comment of 1744. He was 13 years old when it went overhead. Um, and this was an object that ranks as one of the top ten brightest recorded comets. It, um, at one point, was reported to have six different tails. It was visible during daylight. It was just this absolutely amazing phenomena that impacted him as a teenager. So he went on to actually become an astronomer when he was an adult. And one of his first logged um, events that he recorded was actually a Mercury transit when he was in his early 20s. And, and so he set about trying to find comets. Right. So back when he was working, we were still trying to figure out this whole observational astronomy thing. There were planets understood planets, then there were stars, and then there were fuzzy things, and we had no clue what the heck all these fuzzy things were. And the real way to make a name for yourself was to discover comets, because, well, there's always the potential they're going to get bright enough and big enough that, you, that everyone can see them, then, of course, your name ends up in all the newspapers. It, it was a good way to become a famous human being. And so Messier, among many other things, set out to discover comets, and over the course of his lifetime, he actually was able to discover 13 different comets at different points. Uh, one of them he shared the designation with his assistant, Mecham. Uh, another one actually ended up getting named after a different uh, observer, Lexel, but it's unclear which of the two was actually the person who should get all the credit for it. 
But the problem with, with trying to be someone discovering comets, and this was a problem that William Herschel and his sister Carolyn also dealt with, was comets start out looking like little tiny fuzzy spat, pat, patches on the sky. And lots of other things look like little tiny fuzzy patches on the sky. And so the only way to tell if you've discovered a comet or not is to wait for the fuzzy patch to move or to have a catalog that lists the fuzzy patch for you. Right. And so you could imagine, if you're just getting into this hobby, uh, that you would point your telescope in the sky, you would scan the skies, you would find a fuzzy bit, and then you would go, ha ha, comet! And then somebody would remind you that, no, no, that's always been there for, you know, as long as people have been watching the sky, back to the drawing board. And so right. I guess he wanted to just cut out this whole problem and, yeah. and build just, a catalog. Just fix it. And, fix and it. so this, this is where, working in, working in France, he developed his northern hemisphere-centric catalog of fuzzy, annoying things to him, objects on the sky. And because he was working when he was working, all of these objects are extremely bright. And everything in the Messier catalog can be seen by binoculars if you're at a dark site. So if you're out in western Texas, if you're in the middle of the prairie of the United States and it's clear, if you're uh, in one of the random rare empty patches that's fairly dark in Europe, in anywhere in Siberia for the most part, unless you're in like Krasnoyarsk, there's, there's not much there. So as long as you're in the north and you're somewhere fairly dark, all of these objects are available for you to look at. It's interesting, though, you said, you know, Northern Hemisphere, right? He was operating out of France, and so there's going to be huge portions of the sky that he had no way to see. Exactly. And even though there's some phenomenal parts of the sky, they're just not on the Messier catalog because he didn't right. notice them, and so they just get less publicity, unfortunately. Well, and, you know, Sir Patrick Moore actually worked to fix this. So there's a catalog called the Caldwell Catalog that um, Patrick used his mother's last name, Caldwell, when he published this catalog. I guess the Moore Catalog would just sound kind of funny. Um, but the Caldwell Catalog is Sir Patrick Moore working in the 1990s to try and fix this problem. So he looked at the fact that there's 109 Messier objects, found a matching list of 109 Southern Hemisphere viewable objects, and created the Caldwell Catalog that brings in all the, the cool things um, from the Southern Hemisphere. So he has, uh, for, for instance, um, the Jewel Box Nebula, 47 uh, Tucane, which is a globular cluster, uh, Omega Centaurus, Centaurus A, all of these different objects are all tied into his catalog, um, allowing people to basically go back and forth between the two hemispheres and have equally biased catalogs on either side of the equator. Yeah, but or the, uh, so, you know, the people in the southern hemisphere, there's some love there, but you know how it goes, right? It's just like whoever gets it out there first and the name sticks and, and that's why, you know, we have Messier marathons, which we're going to talk about at some point later on. Um, Right, okay, so he, so he went through this process, he gathered together this list of all these objects so that he could discover comets and in the end, you know, discovered, as you said, quite a few on right. his own. And but then those aren't his lasting legacy. His lasting legacy is this catalog of things that annoy yeah, him. Yeah, not the comets, but in fact the, the not comets. Right. Which he didn't discover, he just put cataloged. them in, cataloged. Which well, in a few cases he was the one who discovered them. I mean, that, that's the thing, is that at the time that he was working, um, yeah, it, it's not to say he was necessarily the first person to view all of these objects, but in several cases, he and his, his uh, assistant, Mecham, were the first ones to write down these objects, which actually um, has led to um, evolving credit on this particular list, for lack of a better way to put it. When, when the catalog was first published, there were only 45 objects in it. Um, and, and then they came out with the second version that brought it up to 103 objects, one of which didn't exist, which always makes for interesting times. Um, but if you look at it today, it's, it's 110 minus one objects. And those additional objects come from folks going through his notes and realizing, wait, they discovered other things that they deserve credit for. So Nicholas uh, Flammaron in 1921 added Messier 104. 
um, after finding a, a note in the margins of one of their catalogs. Uh, M105 through 107 were, ed were added by Helen Sawyer Hogg in 1947. Owen Gingrich was still adding objects in 1960. Um, so this has been an evolving process as people go through the original documentation and this is where archivists can play such an important role in making sure people get the right credit for the discoveries. So it became 110 objects based on realizing, hey, wait, they, they're the ones that discovered this. Let's make sure they get credit in their catalog for their discoveries. So in fact, the Messier, so, so what you're saying then is then the Messier catalog lived long after Messier's life himself and yeah. other people were able to to contribute to it and I mean but is it is it locked and closed down now is there any way that people will ever be adding things apart from say historical discoveries well there there's always the the possibility that someone will be going through letters someone will be going through notebooks and realize oh wait, here's this other thing that was discovered that we just don't have a record of. So you can never say never to something like that. But at this point, I, I think, especially after Owen Gingrich, who's an amazing astronomer and an amazing historian, um, after he went through all the records, I, I think we can probably close the door and new things being added. But you never know when another letter is going to be discovered. Or some other object could appear. I mean, some of the objects are are supernova remnants, and so you can imagine in the far future, you know, we'll end up with a new supernova remnant because of... Right, some, but I don't uh, think they'll give credit to Messier for something new. No, that's true, that's true. But so I that, wonder, That's you a know, new catalog. Yeah, exactly, point. right. Um, okay, so then what kinds of objects would we find in the Messier catalog? Well, it, it's anything, by definition, that could, through a low-power telescope or a pair of binoculars, cause an observer to go, is that a comet? So all these types of things are either stars that are so close together that their light kind of combines into a cloud, or things that are actually cloudy. Um, so we, we have open clusters like the Pleiades, globular clusters like M13 and Hercules, which is this uh, tight little cotton ball of stars on the sky. There's planetary nebula, there's supernovae remnants, there's random nebula, so like the North American nebula is this big, beautiful red object on the sky, gas that um, has starlight passing through it and the blues get filtered out so that we see the beautiful reds. Um, and then there's galaxies, and Messier didn't even know what galaxies were, but he, he, along with Herschel, is responsible for finding some of the most beautiful ones in the sky. I mean, even up to 100 years ago, they called them nebula. I, yeah. The great nebula in, in Andromeda, right? The Less Andromeda than 100 years Less ago. Than 100, we, were, yeah. we were still arguing, not we, but I mean, what's, what's amazing is you talk to Owen Gingrich, who's one of the oldest professional astronomers, uh, who's also done all the history work, and you ask, what's the most amazing discovery in your lifetime? And they say, galaxies. <laughs> galaxies, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? okay. That's pretty amazing. New okay, perspective yeah. on yeah, everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, these are our all objects that look cloudy until you start to, to really resolve them with larger and larger telescopes. And so, okay, and so then are there, um, oh man, I lost my question there. I had a really good question that I Sorry, lost Preston. it. Sorry, Preston. Sorry, Preston, you have to edit this one out. Um, no, okay, I'm going to tack over it a different way then. Okay. Um, so then, you know, both you and I have done some some visual observing, and so, you know, what are your favorite of the Messier objects? I, I have to admit, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, it's, it's what everyone absolutely adores, and I, I'm just a follower on this one. It's one of my favorite objects. Um, I used the McDonald Observatory 30-inch telescope, which has a giant field of view. Um, to, to image this any time that I, I couldn't use the telescope for my science. So while waiting for the moon to set, I'd be out there happily observing my galaxy, trying to get a beautiful, pretty picture of it. I'm going to say that my favorite is the Ring Nebula. The Ring Nebula. Yeah. That, that one's a challenge because it's not that large on the sky. Well, it's, it's not that large, but it is... Um, 
It's M57, right. It's not that large, but it actually, I was able to find it in my, I have had a little four-inch telescope growing up, and that was one of the first objects that I was able to, to find. And I think what was great about the Ring Nebula is it really looks like a little ring. It with does. a lot of the other things, as you said, you know, with the Whirlpool Galaxy, yeah, if you've got a 30-inch telescope, then, then you can see, and you've got a nice long exposure, then you can see the beautiful spiral nature. But if you're just doing visual observing, looking through the, your eyepiece, there's not a lot of these objects that look like like what they're supposed to look like in the right. pictures. But the Ring Nebula, for me, always really looked like a little ring floating in space. Um, and then I would say the um, the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules. Yeah, that that one is just it, it's harder to find than than you'd think. I I don't know how many nights I spent basically lying on my back, binoculars yeah. in one hand, planisphere in the other hand trying, you can't look through both at once, or look at and through at once, yeah. um, desperately trying to star hop my way there. Right, you've got to go up and down, yeah, you got to go up and down between these two stars on the side of, of Hercules trying to find right. it, trying to find it, so, and then of course I would say <coughs> the Great Nebula in Orion, which is just an absolute beautiful, clearly fuzzy bit in the sky, which is even starting to show some color, which is fairly it, rare yeah. for for a lot of these kinds of objects. And what, what's kind of amazing is, is the sheer diversity in objects that he found. So you have everything from extremely disturbed galaxies to these beautiful classic galaxies. You have little tiny objects like the Owl Nebula, which is another one of my favorites. It's a little planetary nebula that just happens to have two darker patches that look Absolutely. like owl eyeballs. Absolutely, it looks like owl eyes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and and it, it's just this amazingly rich uh, way to get people engaged in astronomy by saying, look at the diversity of beautiful things that we have in our field. And, and the name is kind of fun to play with. As, as a little kid and as someone who has absolutely no understanding of the French language, um, other than what you learned from Miss Peggy on the Muppets, which isn't useful in France, I learned. Um, it, it, Messier, you don't see it as Messier, you see it as, messi as messier, like your messier bedroom. Mm -hmm. And as a little kid, I, I, I read it that way. I thought this was the catalog of messy objects on the sky. And that's actually a really neat way to engage people. Um, look at what the universe has to offer. Not everything is perfect and symmetric and beautiful the way you expect the planets to be. Sometimes you have things that look like squished bugs. And then when you start to understand them, you realize they look like that because this is two galaxies that collided into one another and they literally splattered across the universe. And, and this is where Messier marathons become so interesting. Yeah, well, I was going to talk about the Messier marathon next as well. So, so what is a Messier marathon? Well, it's, it's uh, basically, just like the name marathon implies, it's a kind of an endurance mission to try and make it through all the objects. And you have to start at the moment the sun gets far enough below the horizon that you can start to pick these objects up. Um, you need to be in the northern hemisphere and ideally somewhere between about 20 and 30 degrees north. So like Texas, Florida, Mediterranean area, these are, these are all fairly good. Uh, northern Africa is fairly ideal. Um, and from these, these latitudes, just as the sun sets in mid-March, you're able to start picking up the westernmost objects um, for that time of year at sunset. And then if you quickly flip through them through the night, you can basically hop from Messier object to Messier object. And just before the sun comes up, if you're good and you're efficient and you find things quickly, you're able to, to make it through the entirety of the list. Now the problem is, you hit certain areas, like the Virgo cluster of galaxies, or the center of the Milky Way, and there's kind of stuff everywhere. And so there's a whole lot of, uh, did I find the right thing? Did I find the wrong thing? Did I, is it? And, and so you have to try and leave time for those objects. You're not actually allowed to linger on anything. Now there's a certain time of year that you have to do it, right? March. You have to it's, do it March, March. You, like very specific time. Right, and, and the reason for this is, is the combination of, well, in, in March, no matter where you are on the planet, you have basically 12-hour long days. Um, 
And so with those basically 12 hour long days, you have just enough time to get through everything. And the other is there is somewhat of a biased east-west in um, when you can see objects. And it just happens to work out that in March is when you're best able to get everything up all at once between sunset and sunrise. Well, what kind of a telescope would you need? What kind of a, you know, to, to definitely complete a Messier marathon, you know, what would be the bare minimum gear that you'd want? Well, if you wouldn't say you're definitely going to, to complete it and you don't care about cheating, I'd say anything with a go-to drive. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> right. um, you don't even have to look through the eyepiece. You just make, no. you know, make sure it's polar aligned and just press the button and just watch your telescope from afar and, you know, you know <laughs> yeah, no, update so it a hundred and whatever, nine times, eight times, right. and you're done. Yeah, so personally, I consider that cheating. Um, so if, if you want to be a purist, um, then, then I'd say you need a good star atlas, paper works, um, a red flashlight, and a pair of perfectly reasonable binoculars. Um, so something with a nice seven degree field of view probably will do it for you. Um, you don't need anything fancy. I mean, the thing to think about is this was discovered by a guy working through a refracting telescope made by hand a couple hundred years ago. Our everyday spotting scopes are way better than anything he could have imagined. Um, now, a nice, easy way to do this if you, if you want to use a telescope is just get yourself a nice 6-inch or 10-inch uh, Dobsonian and move your light bucket around the sky gathering light and what's neat is so many people have spent so much time in trying to figure out how to do this well and how to do this right that there's actually if you search around you can find okay so do this object this object right. hop from here to here instructions on how to do this efficiently yeah you don't want to do them in order you don't start at one yeah. and go to two and go you know you you have to start in whatever object is is closest to the to the horizon, although Close they, to setting. yeah, but in, in some cases, the, you know, the numbers are kind of similar because as he was creating his numbers, he was, you know, there's like, what is it, M81 and M82 are, are two side pops. by side, they're side by side, and they're in, you know, they're actually probably interacting in Ursa Major, and so, you know, there's some that are connected in that way, but in many cases, yeah, you really got to, the only possible yeah. way to do this is to follow someone's list, their checklist, and then you know, do a few practice runs and try to make sure, you know, different times of the year and make sure that you can, you can find these constellations and find them fairly rapidly and then when the time is ready, you know, get your gear and do it. One, one of the confusing things about the Mesea catalog is it's not ordered by type of object, so you don't find all the planetary nebula clustered together in numbers. It's not ordered numerically from east to west. Um, it's pretty much in the order that they found things. And, and so while there are pockets of numbers that, that go together, uh, the Virgo cluster stands out rather nicely, um, the rest of it is just kind of random. So you, you just need to get yourself a map. And it's just like taking any tourist trip. You have to figure out what roads you're going to take to get from one stop to the next. So, and this is one of the things that, I, that we're planning, we, I don't know if people have been watching, but we've been doing these live star parties on Google+, Plus and we've been connecting together four or five telescopes all at the same yeah. time and streaming into a Google+, Plus Hangout, and so our, my m maybe plan in March is to try and do a Messier Marathon, but do it in like a couple of hours. So right. just have, you know, astronomers around the world all streaming together with their go-to telescopes, and just, you know, just knock it off, get a world record. Well, and, and the thing is, we can seriously cheat because we can get observers that are spanning six hours oh, yeah. across the planet and always get them at zenith. So Absolutely. we just yeah. wait for the objects to be in the ideal spot in the sky and then we check them off of our list. Yeah, now that's exactly. totally cheating. We we will not earn any certificates for completing a Mesier <laughs> Marathon doing this. Are there certificates that you There get? are actually. Really? Okay. So yeah, the Astronomical League uh, has put together certificates for how you observe and how many you observe in a given night. I, I tried really hard to get my Mesier certification with binoculars when I failed. <laughs> I, I got lost in Sagittarius and couldn't differentiate from one object to the next before I got called off to go do something else. That's cool. I I would like to do that some year. I so then like if people really want to just do it, pair of binoculars, 
sky sky chart. What would you yeah. say? You know, if you want to start discovering your Messier objects, and then you don't have to do it in one night. You know, because yeah. you know different t different parts of the sky will be visible at different times of the year, and you'll have the optimum times to do it. And you can just kind of pick away at it segment yeah. by by segment. Um, there's a uh, um, on Universe Today, uh, Tammy uh, Plotner used to do a Messier week. And so she would recommend that you just take a course of a week to chip away at a Messier marathon and just, you know, instead of trying to kill yourself in one night. So, well, so but, then, but then gear, I just want to talk about that, just last thing, if people want to start doing this and really see the Messier objects and identify them, you said sort of what? So seven, like bare minimum five binoculars, maybe a little better than that, right? Um, I I think ten by forties. Ten by forties is what I'd go for. Okay. Um, the the larger the the front aperture you can get, the better. Um, fifty, sixty, just increase that number in until they get too heavy to to hold. Um, so bare minimum equipment is a good atlas. Um. They make them online, which yeah. saves time and energy. Just make sure that whatever you're using has a red mode so you don't blow your dark adaption. Um, nice pair of binoculars. And then I use, we have one of those hammocks on a stand in our backyard. And, and so I'm up off the ground and comfortable nested in my hammock unless the dog decides to join me, in which case we swing a little bit violently. Yeah, binoculars. Um, Pointed yeah, stack. lawn chair, something like that. Something that allows you to lie down and be comfortable without the creepy ca crawlies crawling on top of you. Um, and the thing about the Messier objects is because they are distributed fairly consistently across the sky, there, there is a, a gap. Um, you can go out a couple hours after sunset every night, take in a few, and then just let the sky pass overhead. And over the course of a year, you can get to see everything yeah. when it's highest in the sky and easiest to view. Yeah. So break it up. Don't, don't get in such a rush. Well, that was and great, And all you Pamela. Southern Hemisphere people, Caldwell Catalog. Caldwell Catalog, yeah. Caldwell Marathon. Caldwell Messier Marathon. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. It's, it's my pleasure, Fraser. Save. Save. Okay, and all you folks out there listening in the internet, we will be with you in a moment. We just need to save. Yeah. I'm good. I'm saved. Okay, I'm saved too. And now I'm flipping over to the Hangout so that I can see all of your tweets and comments. How is your time? Um, I'm doing okay. Okay. Awesome. All right, well, so then if anyone wants, uh, you can ask questions here in the comments, either on the Twitter or uh, you can ask questions in the comments on, uh, on the Google Plus Hangout that we're doing. Uh, and then I will post a link to the Hangout, and if you guys want to join us and ask us some questions or tell us some cool Messier stories, uh, we'd love to have you join us. Yeah. So let me just uh, get that happening. And if you can plus one, and we'd love to know where you all are. Um, the Twitter address is, um, well, we're, I'm at Star Strider. He's at Universe Today. We are together at Astronomy Cast. And the hashtag is pound CQX, pound Hangout. And that's for CosmoQuest because we're using the CosmoQuest Hangout channel to produce this, our star parties, and many other different things. All right. I don't think Fraser's Kitchen was a better background, the person who, uh, William Reynolds. They prefer my, my kitchen? I've been I testing don't. out different backgrounds, I know. <laughs> I've been moving around, sometimes upstairs. But today, the kids are home today, and uh, so it's very loud if I'm trying to be in the same room as them. And they cannot be quiet. It's just not physically possible for them to try oh, no. to keep it quiet. Not <coughs> the kids. I couldn't either. Hello. Hello. How goes? So I'm the first person to join the side YouTube? Yeah, yes. you're the first person. Cool. Cool. I had such a good time last week, so I'm looking forward to talking to awesome. you. Awesome. Have, you, have you done a Messier marathon? Have you got some Messier stories for us? Uh, no, unfortunately I don't. You know, this is actually the first I've learned about it. You know, I, I listen to, you know, on my iTunes, I've listened to every astronomy cast at least ten times. <laughs> But uh, 
I, I didn't know anything about messier objects, and so uh, I learned a lot uh, from this recent. Uh, yeah, those are the M designations. Right? When you're at M51, M33, yeah. M1, that's Messier. Oh, okay. One, and, and I didn't know that either. You should have said that in the episode, probably. Yeah, oh, well. we probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> we realize these things now and then. You, you know what actually um, uh, came to my mind? Um, I know this isn't related necessarily to Messier, Messier objects, but, um, you know, I live in Orlando, and... I would say it's probably got to be one of the worst places to look up in the sky. It's, it's terrible. It's not dark and that kind of thing. Yeah. But I remember back in 97, I think it was, it was hale you know? Yes. And uh, that was the most incredible thing I ever saw in my life. Uh, I, I mean, I've never seen it, and it lasted for such a long time. Yeah. And, uh, I mean... I mean, I know that's not a Messier object, but uh, it was a comet, and it, and uh, it was it was very memorable to me. So that just kind of came into my head when you started talking about Messier objects and comets and so forth. Yeah, there was I've I've seen two big ones, right? There was Hale Bop, and there was was it Hakitake? Hakitake. Hakitake, and uh, Hakitake was I think was even nicer, as I recall. Yeah, I but think it was so just too. a phenomenal comet, phenomenal experience. I was living in Vancouver at the time, and we drove you know, out of the city to get really nice dark skies and you could just see the comet from almost horizon stretching up and yeah. you could see the two tails. Just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. I'm I just want like we haven't had a really nice comet in ten years. I'm I want to show the kids a comet, but we just haven't had some really nice ones yet. But you know, be patient. Well, you know, that was, a, that was also a question I had because, um, you know, when I saw Hale Bob, I'd never seen anything quite like that before. And um, I haven't seen anything since. And I'm just wondering, you know, Pamela, about how often do those types of events occur? Uh, uh, they're fairly random. Um, uh -huh. So the fact that we had both Hale Bob and Kyakutaki just a couple of years apart, um, that that's not a common occurrence. You you can usually expect one really bright um, stunner of a comet per couple of decades, um, but there's no way to predict it. I mean that that's one of the frustrations is you try and predict oh this passage of uh, comet uh, pick one um, is going to be absolutely phenomenal and then the comet will decide it's going to be invisible. Right. Um, or you'll say, like was said with Comet McNaught, oh, it's not going to be interesting, no one will be, and it becomes a daytime object. Right. These, these are extremely frustrating objects to figure out when to get excited, what to get excited over, and um, how often they're going to occur. Now, is the, is the period, does that mean the number of years it'll take before it occurs again? Yeah. Okay, so, because I think I saw, uh, I was doing a little bit of quick research on hale -Bopp, and I think the period was something like 2,300 years. So, um, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I, I don't know that comet. Mm -hmm. A lot of comets actually just come by once, and then they, they're they gone. And that's it. Yeah. yeah. But like Halley's Comet, for instance, that's like every 76 years, right? Right. So so there's, there's different types of comets that have different types of peri periodicities. Um, hale -Bopp is one that has a habit of doing interesting things. Um, and there's actually some that believe various chunks of it have hit the Earth at different points in our history, which is something oh. interesting to think about. So its, it's orbital period is about 2,500 years. So, yeah, it, it's right. one that comes back not very often. Right. Well, we have to wait a long time to see that one again. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a question in the comments. So Rod Mole wanted to know, how long would it have taken Charles Messier to collect all these, his list of objects? Um, he really did it over the course of his lifetime. So he started in the 20s. Uh, he started when he was in his 20s, and let me pull up information to find out how long he lived. Um, I know it was really one of these things where he died and they finished putting the catalog together for him. Um, so it was originally published with 45 objects in 1771. It was still getting updated in the 60s, um, 1960s, by people who were going through his notes. Um, and Charles Messier lived up until 1817 where, when he died at the age of 86. So he was long lived and he pretty much did astronomy his entire life. Wow. Um, and then, oh, and uh, um, 
Oh, who is it? Somebody mentioned. Oh, that's right. Robert uh, McLarty mentioned Comet Lovejoy, which was which was the big our big excitement this year. Comet Lovejoy was this comet that was supposed to smash into the sun or get torn up and disappear, and in fact and reappeared didn't. on the far side of the sun and then started to brighten up. And this is one of those this cool things. You can get this possibility where comets will actually brighten up after they do a sun graze. So right. that's often, you know, if you want to maybe have a bright comet, that's on the checklist. Well, and really nice sun grazing because then it just blows out and gets a lot more brighter and close to the sun. And one of the interesting things that happened, I think it was with that one, is its tail actually got n unattached. And uh, so, so you can get all sorts of neat things happening depending on how the uh, solar winds interact with the comet. And unfortunately, Lovejoy was really only visible to the southern hemisphere. <coughs> so those of us in the northern hemisphere had to live vicariously. But I was actually posting, there's some great pictures that were coming in like every day people from the southern hemisphere were going out and taking beautiful pictures and then posting yeah. them and we were living through them but we never got a chance to get it visible here in the in the northern hemisphere who joined us Matthew Jones Hey Matthew hi guys how's it going it's going well how are you good so do you have a question for us or Pamela of course <laughs> well I do have stories um part of the San Francisco amateur astronomers and we go up and Every year we do the whole little um, messier object, um, little challenge, try to see as many as we can. So it's always a good time. So where do you guys go to do it? Uh, it's called Mount Tam. It's just north of San Francisco. It's a beautiful place. And has it got pretty so. good dark skies? Or? Uh, I get a little bit of wash from San Francisco, um, but it's... It's probably the best place we can see in the area. So, and so I people, Lake Tahoe is pretty good. Yeah. If people are in San Francisco and they want to participate, when do you? How often do you guys do like observing nights? I think we have lag. Do we have lag? Yeah. Bit of a connection problem there, maybe. Yeah, this is one of the problems with doing things live. Is occasionally the internet says no. Nope. Often, yeah, uh, you know, I have a quick question, and and uh, I I was always to the understanding that comets, uh, the reason why they're so visible is because they have a lot of reflective properties from being mostly composed of ice. Is that correct? Right. Is yeah, that's that's entirely true. So just like Europa is easy to see because it's shiny, uh -huh. um, comets are easy to see because they're shiny as well. It's it's water is a good reflector, and we have Matthew moving again, so I'm guessing that you're back with us live again. Go ahead, Matthew. You still there? Oh. No. Nope. Well, well, he's he's lagged. I I will pitch. He reminded. Oh wait, are he? And lagged again. <laughs> um. So, so Matthew's actually helping organize a meetup for us. So on February 26th, I'm going to be in the San Francisco area for um, a space conference on commercial space. And I'll be talking about CosmoQuest there and citizen science. And while I'm down in San Francisco, uh, Matthew has helped organize. We're going to do a meetup at the SETI Institute. Oh, cool. Um, so anyone who wants to join us, this is completely free. We're probably going to order pizza, so we will try and get a couple bucks out of you to order pizza. Um, but other than that, come out and join us. And if you want to get the details, everything is at meetup.com slash CosmoQuest. Wow. Where's the City Institute in the city? Um, I can tell you the address. It's, it's at 189 North... Uh, uh, Bernardo in Mountain View, California. Um, I have to admit, I simply go where my cell phone's GPS tells me to go. Right. No, so we'll be great. in Mountain View is where right. we're going to be. If, if I was in the area, I'd definitely come. Uh, it's, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm in Florida, but uh, I, I got to say, um, I'm just a really huge fan of you guys. I, I, I can't say that enough. Um, and I would love to meet you both someday. It would be just the coolest thing. I mean, you kind of have rock star status in my mind. You know? so, um, Thank you, thank you very much. I, I find the episodes, each one, so educational. And, you know, I have an interest in astronomy, but it's not my field of study. 
Um, and each one of those episodes I listened to, I, I learned so much. And I I have a collection of things that I've learned over the course of the time you've done the program. And uh, I just I just think it's fantastic. And I do my best to try to extend your program out to other people uh, so they can join in as well. Yeah, we've got lots of people that oh, inflict astronomy cast on the people in their car and <laughs> stuff like that, right? <clears throat> so we've been joined by Thad Sazbo? Zabo. Zabo? Dad, can you hear us? We just see an oh, icon. Oh, the day of technological fail. Yeah. They must okay, so we have Dave. <laughs> so we have Damien Trin saying in the comments, um, since meteor showers are caused by the Earth moving in the path of dust and such in space, will there be a point where some meteor showers will no longer occur and that there were meteor showers in the past but no longer occur now? Um, so, so one of the neat things about a lot of the meteor showers that we deal with is the, the places keep getting replenished. So we keep passing through the tail of... Uh, Halley's Comet. We keep passing through the tail, or where the tail previously was of Halley's Comet, where the tail previously was of Hale Bopp. And so there's this regular replenishment of the places where the meteor showers occur. Um, so, yeah, some of the streams will eventually pretty much dry up. It'll take a long time. There's a lot of dust out there to be vacuumed. Um, but over time, these uh, many of the different streams do get replenished, leading to amazing showers the years after they've been replenished? That is a good question. I, I was, I often wondered that myself. I figured that, you know, over time they disappear, but I did not know they got replenished. That's yep. I wonder if there was a time in the past where there was like some really big comet went by and left a lot of particles and there was just phenomenal meteor showers year after year after year. Well, there, there was one back at the turn of the 1900s. Um, where it literally looked like it was raining debris oh. and there was a variety of different songs and newspaper, everyone thought it was the end of the world pretty much. Um, but it was just one of these things where you went outside and just like during the day you'd see pouring rain. Imagine going outside at night and seeing pouring shooting stars streaking across wow. the sky. Wow. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, don't, aren't we due for a meteor shower in March? Or is uh, there's, there's a whole variety. Pretty much every month of the year has its own shower of, of varying different degrees and sizes. I see. But the, there's, like a, there's a couple times a year where we have a major meteor shower, right? Like is that the Pleiades? Or? Well, so there, there's the Geminids in December. There's, um, let me pull up a, a calendar. There's a big oh, one sorry. in August and a big one in November. So, oh, so okay. Those, okay. those are the ones that... I always remember, and Geminids are in December, and I simply remember that because my right. birthday is usually during the Geminids. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, one of the things that, uh, and I'm sure this is something very familiar with you, you all, but I tend to see the most objects in the sky in the wintertime um, because that's when there's usually, you know, clearer skies and it's colder, and it seems when it's colder I'm able to see a lot more. So I find myself not looking up a whole lot during the summer because, you know, I live in Florida too, so we got a lot of clouds and that kind of thing. But um, I don't know, just, a, just an observation. Um, oh, sorry, Martin Brochu asked a question. Um, how likely is it for an amateur astronomer to spot a comet or asteroid, and is there any chance or are they all mostly documented? No, so, so amateur astronomers are still regularly making uh, comet discoveries. It's getting a little bit harder, not because they've all been discovered, but rather because you're competing against computer surveys. So as you end up with things uh, so that you see all of the comet linears, all of the comet nears, these, these are all from a variety of different surveys. So the trick is to look in the sky in the places not being covered by the surveys. And, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, crazy thing about comets, right, is most of them, yeah, just haven't been documented. In fact, yeah. was it the NASA SOHO satellite is the most uh, active comet discoverer in the, on, on the planet because it's always discovering these comets moments before they crash into the sun. Yeah. Um, but with, and with asteroids, uh, there's lots of people that are amateurs that are discovering asteroids. And in many cases, people are, even computer scientists are discovering asteroids. They just go and look at great big catalogs of the sky. Oh, yeah find big lists of asteroids, 
and find, you know, look through the sky and do comparative, you know, compare pictures against each other and look for little objects that are moving back and forth. Right. And, and they've discovered asteroids. And, they've and, and this compared. is also a way to discover Kuiper Belt objects if they image deep enough. Yeah, yeah, so it's different. Hi, Bridget. Hello. Do you have a question for us, Bridget? Um, well, my only question is, do you have any kind of, like, favorite um, astronomy creation myths, like the creation of the Milky Way as a silver river to k keep two lo uh, lovers apart or something like that? Um, I, I've always liked the, the Native American um, stories of the coyote. Um, and of course, now that you say this, I can't remember the details of the story to save my life. But it's, it's basically the coyote's lover has been put up into the stars, and this is why the coyote howls at the moon. So it's, there's, there's so many out there. It's, um, in, in South Africa, there um, are completely different myths, as you might imagine. And I got to see this fabulous quilt on the wall at Sutherland Observatory's uh, Visitor Center. And the seven sisters of the Pleiades in, down there are actually um, a bunch of different wives. And the husband is Orion. And, and that's just an interesting idea that you have Orion and his wives. Um, so there's just all of these different stories and um, some of the Native American ones aren't always necessarily tied to the stars, but it's interesting to compare how you get great floods, for instance, in so many different creation myths across the world and it shows that we really have had um, stories that predate people spreading out across the surface of the planet. Um, Matthew Jones, uh, he was he was in here before. He was the per the guy from from San Francisco, and he he's crashing. But he just wanted to say that um, the San Francisco Astronomy Club meets twice a month, once for public viewing with a cool lecture, and once for club members only. You can go to sfaa-astronomy.org. And I always recommend, I mean, if people ever want to look through a telescope or want to just get a sense of what it's like to, you know, do some amateur astronomy, I always recommend that you go and find yeah. your local astronomy club. There will always be one in almost every place on the planet, uh, unless you really live in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, even small towns will have them. And then find, you know, do a search for your town and astronomy club, and you should be able to find one. Go find out their, their public nights drop in, often they'll have like tons of telescopes set up and you can look through the different telescopes and see the different setups and talk to people and make some friends and, and uh, yeah, it's a great way to get into astronomy. So that's great that you guys are doing that. And, and there's a lot of different groups online. Um, Alistair Lehi, I believe is how you say his last name, last name uh, does the online astronomy club, uh, which is largely organized through Facebook, and we'll we'll put a link out for them. So even if you are someplace where you're just not sure how to get tied in with your local astronomers, well, there's always online astronomers waiting to reach out and help you. All right, so I think we're getting just near the end of our hour now. So if anyone has any more questions, uh, or if you want to jump in and, and ask a question, I think we've got a, a link to the Hangout in the post. Um, otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up. Can Maybe I just I'll make one quick comment? Before totally. We, um, just a, an idea for um, an astron astronomy cast program. Um, I was thinking about uh, the Einstein-Rosen bridge um, theory, and I was wondering maybe if you might introduce that at some point to the program. Wasn't that Thor? Wasn't that they used in the movie yeah. Thor? <laughs> yeah, so, so if, if there are clear predictions and observations possible, but we try, we try and constrain ourselves only to testable theories. I'd love to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I try to constrain us strictly yeah. to testable theory, and I try to I try to at least push us so that uh, then Pamela can can uh, say, you know, that there's no evidence for them. Right. But and, and we well, found no evidence so far, right? Right. I no, see. it's it's one of those things. What, what is it? I mean, I don't know if you've even done the research on it. I I what? haven't. I re it's yeah. something I remember the name and and I remember seeing Thor and I, yeah. I'm afraid well, that. Well, well, I understood it to uh, relate to wormholes and that type. Yeah. Of thing. Right, and wormholes can't exist, so I probably stopped reading at that stage. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Cool. All right. Well, I think we'll I think we'll wrap it up at this point. Again, if you're watching this live, if you can plus one it, that would be amazing. Uh, the next thing we're going to be doing is Wednesday. On Thursday. On Wednesday. No, oh, right. that's right. We're gonna we're gonna record another episode of Astronomy Cast on Wednesday to try and uh, get one in the can because you're going to be doing some traveling shortly. Yeah which I get, believe we just talked about. Uh, and then uh, Thursday at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, we're going to be doing our weekly space hangout with uh, Phil Plait and Emily Lakdawalla and everybody, um, Nicole and Ian and Alan and, yeah, all of, our, all, of our, all of our space friends. So we'll be doing that at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, 6 Greenwich Mean Time. 6 and 5 a.m. Sydney. 5 a.m. Sydney. Sorry, time. Sydney. Yeah, you're getting the times down pretty good now. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be doing that on on Thursday, and also we've got planned at least one or two star parties tonight, uh, depending on how the scene is for people. So again, you you need to follow, you need to circle uh, circle me or Pamela to be tonight able to or see this when week. Um, maybe Thursday night. Uh, okay. It all depends on people's people's uh, schedules. So when, when they good. got clear seeing, I try to sort of get a few people who I know are going to be able to put on a good show and then try and wrap it in more astronomers. It's a tasty astronomer sandwich. So. It's good to know we taste good. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, I think we're just wrapping it up now. So uh, Thank thanks you. to everybody who listened. Thanks for everyone who jumped in with us. And uh, we will see everybody uh, next time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.